to our session today on copyright. My name is John Sadler. I'm the director of the Law Library. It's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Just a couple of minutes in the front. Uh, our speaker today is Samuel Trossel, professor uh, jointly appointed at the Faculty of Information and Media Studies and also the Faculty of Law. Uh, Sam is a, an expert in copyright law, a prolific author. Uh, he has a, a chapter in a book that's just been published by Urban Law. The book is called From Radical to Ex Extremism uh, to Balance Copyright, Canadian Copyright and the Digital Agenda. And uh, his, his chapter is on Bill C-32 in the educational sector. Uh, I see a number of people here who uh, were at our initial session, which was held in July over at, the, at FIMS. Uh, and uh, Professor Trasso will be uh, bringing us up to speed on some of the developments that have happened since then. Uh, with respect to uh, both Bill C-32 and the uh, Access Copyright Chair. So please join me in introducing uh, Sam Trasso. Thank you, John. Thank you for the very kind introduction. And I'd like to start by thanking the Western Libraries for sponsoring this again, in particular, the excellent work that Adrian uh, Ho is doing as the Access Librarian here at Western. It's very fortunate to have um, uh, a librarian uh, designated to be the access librarian and the work that he's done with Scholarship Western and on copyright and open access issues speaks very well for the Western Library and I think it's a model that a lot of other universities could be uh, emulating. I'm, I'm really glad to be here in the law school today. Um, this is where I teach. This is the, this is the classroom I teach in. Um, I'm, very, I'm very comfortable up here because this is, my, this is the class I teach property in. Um, so I'm just, going to, I'm just going to get started. How many of you were here for my July presentation? Okay. So there's, there's some overlap, but my, my goal here today is to bring this up to date. Because there have been quite, quite a few developments since July. Some of them very good, some of them not so good. And um, I'll, I'll work through those. So I think I want to position myself so... Can you see both me and the, and the, um, and the screen? That's, that's great. So basically, by way of background information, um, we have Bill C-32 that was introduced earlier this year. We have, we have Bill C-32 that was introduced earlier this year. And then also uh, filed earlier this year was the Access Copyright Act um, that was filed with the Copyright Board earlier this year. It's not, it's not my intention in a one-hour presentation to go through the entire uh, magnitude of the changes that are in Bill C-32, and indeed uh, the upcoming presentation next week will, uh, will, prompt, will prompt to do that. There's going to be a, a much more detailed presentation about the, uh, the digital locks provision. So I'm, I'm just going to really um, brush through Bill C-32 today, but what I want to pull out of 32 is the overlap that exists between the Access Copyright Tariff and Bill C-32 in higher, in higher education. The reason I call this talk double trouble, or still double trouble, is it does appear to me, and I'll develop this towards the end, it does appear to me that some of the provisions in the Access Copyright Tariff um, overlap quite a bit with some of the provisions in Bill C-32, and I believe that there is a concerted effort by Access Copyright and its supporters to um, create provisions in the new in the new in the new bill that will make the of its its proposed tariff a lot easier. One thing that's really important to remember from the beginning: a university does not have to accept the terms of a proposed tariff. A university has the policy has a policy decision to make about whether it wants to continue with the access copyright tariff or whether it wants to walk. Everything goes poorly at the copyright board, which I hope is not the case. But even if everything goes really poorly at the copyright board, indiv individual universities can still say, you know, we don't need this tariff, and there are some other things that we can do to protect ourselves from potential copyright liability, and at the same time provide our students and academic staff with the resources that they need to do their work. Now, in order to get into some of the um, implications of the proposed tariff, it's necessary to talk a little bit about copyright basics. Uh, I can't do a full introduction to copyright law in the short amount of time I have. And looking around the room, I sense that most of you have already had some type of 
introduction to copyright law. So I'm going to breeze through that really, really quickly and then try to uh, get into the, in, uh, in more detail, the problems with the proposed tariff. Um, I gave a talk at the, at, for, for the Weldon Library um, two, a year or two ago, and uh, you, you can access that on my scholarship on Weldon and Press um, 3. That, that talk goes into more detail about copyright basics. But just, just in a nutshell, the important copyright points that we need to, that we need to have when we discuss the tariff is what are the exclusive rights that the owner has? And basically, Section 3 of the Copyright Act creates the exclusive rights for the owners. And the, the main one that we're concerned about here is to produce the work or any substantial part of it in any material form. And there are a variety of other rights in Section 3 um, to publicly perform the work, to communicate the work to the public by telecommunication. There are various other sole exclusive rights in the work translation, adaptations, um, and to authorize any of the exclusive rights. For our purposes today, we're most concerned with the reproduction right, because that is the, uh, that is the right that's implicated by the access copyright uh, tariff. The, the next important copyright point to make is, what is copyright infringement? Because I think the main reason why we're concerned about the whole the whole question of the access copyright tariff or license, as it previously was called, is that we want to avoid copyright liability. We want to avoid copyright infringement liability. We want to protect our institutions against uh, the threat of substantial infringement liability. The problem with uh, the Copyright Act, the way it's understood by people, not so much the way it's drafted, but the way it's understood by people, is people understand Section 27. People understand that it's an infringement to do something without the consent of the owner that the owner has the sole exclusive right to do. Now, that is not the picture of clarity in terms of how it's drafted because it's circular. In order for this to make sense, you have to refer back to Section 3. So what we're talking about here is things that, um, things that only the copyright owner has the right to do is, is the, the right to reproduce, the right to communicate to the public, to authorize any of the above, and the other things that are in Section 3. But most people know enough about copyright to know that if you make a photocopy of something without the permission of the owner, and notice I'm talking about the owner here, not the author. It's the, it's the owner's exclusive right. If you do that, you, you, without consent, you have committed what's, what's known as a prima facie infringement. And unfortunately, it, the analysis often stops there. Because fortunately, just because something constitutes prima facie infringement within the meaning of Section 27 doesn't mean that it's actionable infringement, and it doesn't mean that there's any substantial likelihood of incurring any serious risk of liability. And that's because a variety of a million lose a lot of things that would otherwise be technically infringement under this, under this um, section. And also notice that consent creates infringement. So if the copyright owner you consent to make copies, you don't even have to get to a fair dealing analysis. You don't have to worry about purchasing a license, an access copyright license, if you've already got permission to make the copies. So, for example, if you go to the library catalog at Western and other universities, you'll see if you, if you search for a journal, you'll find really increased their digital holdings. Many journals that academics use, that students use for their for their course for their course readings have already been have already been purchased. We've already purchased the consent of the publisher through a site license. And you go to the university catalog, the uh, ProQuest and many other many here in the law school in particular, the law library has gone gone to great lengths to negotiate particular licenses with the Lexus and the eCarswell vendors uh, in, order that, in order so our law students will have unimpeded access to uh, really good college. These are things that we've, we've got permission from the copyright owner to use in our instruction. Students have permission to, to, make, to make copies. So we don't have to get involved in a fair deal analysis because we have, we have consent. So you check to see if a publication is available to the library, in, in the library catalog. And if it is, there would be no reason to put that type of article in a 
And of course, the use of course packs has decreased so much over the last few years. I just, I just think back to when I first came here 10 years ago. Course packs were, were in much heavier use than they are now. And this is, a, this is a very serious concern for access copyright because a substantial portion of their revenues comes from the higher education sector, although we don't know for sure because their annual reports only provide their, uh, their revenue information in the aggregate. So we know that access copyrights annual revenues from all licensing sources is in the neighborhood of 30 to 35 million dollars a year. And it's estimated that about half of that comes from the educational sector, perhaps a little, perhaps a little bit, perhaps a little bit more. But we have the consent in the case of many, many uh, journals and other and other forms of scholarship that are directly relevant to what we're doing in our courses. So the other thing is, in addition to express consent in the form of a license from, from the publisher directly or an aggregator, consent, consent can also be implied. Uh, you see a lot of uh, logos these days on, on websites that say things like email, print, send to a friend. Um, when you see something like email, print, send to a friend, that's a, that's a signal to you that there's certain things that you can do with that media, with the consent of the owner. That's, so you would not even have a prima facie case of a copyright infringement. If a web page says email, print, send to a friend, you can't make, you can't publish it, bind it, put it through a mass distribution, make 10,000 copies of it, and send it, and send it to market, and compete, and compete with the uh, original owner. But you certainly can, uh, you certainly can do things that would be reasonably anticipated by somebody that puts something like that on the internet. When people put things on the internet these days, when people upload <coughs> things to the internet these days, they're well aware of the fact that there are overhead projectors, they're well aware of the fact that there are copy, paste, select all commands uh, in, in, in your interface, and so we have to take this notion of consent um, very, very broadly. Um, so assuming that you have a, a, a triggering of a Section 3 right, a, sub a substantial reproduction, and there's no consent, your next, your next question would be to turn to fair dealing. And currently, the Canadian, the Canadian copyright law says that fair dealing for purposes of research or private study does not infringe copyright. And there's a similar, there's similar language uh, for criticism or review and news reporting with attribution. One of the positive proposals of C32 course would be the addition of the words education and the addition of the words parody and satire to section 29. So instead of research or private study, you would add the words education, satire, parody. And of course, there's an intense lobbying uh, campaign going on right now by Access Copyright and other owners groups who are very um, upset about that. And the question is whether or not that education exception whether the inclusion of education and fair dealing is going to survive second or third reading is a matter of uh, immediate concern for us, is a matter of immediate concern for all of us. For many years, we were not really clear what the scope of those fair dealing provisions were. In fact, it wasn't until the 21st century that courts, that courts, started, to, that courts started to change the, the, the normal, the, the traditional historical posture. Um, historically, fair dealing was strictly construed. It was narrowly construed. It was given a very hostile reaction by the Canadian courts, and it was felt that the overall importance of copyright law was to protect the property interests of the owner. So something like fair dealing, which takes away from the owner's rights, should be very narrowly construed. And in fact, the trial court decision in CCH um, and, and much of the earlier case law was all about denying fair dealing. And then in 2002, we had somewhat of a breakthrough. We had the Court of Appeal decision in uh, the CCH case say that fair dealing really needs to be broadly construed. And then on top of that, we had the, 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 the massive shift in the Supreme Court decision in 2004, where a unanimous Supreme Court said that the fair dealing exception is, 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 is properly understood as a defense. However, users' rights are not just loopholes. Both owner rights and user rights should be given the fair and balanced reading uh, that they deserve. And in the case of research, which was under consideration in the CCH case, 
research must be given a large and liberal interpretation. And this really changed, this really changed the whole fair dealing, uh, the perspective on fair dealing. It's now something that's considered to be an, a, a user's right that's an integral part of the act. And when we try to do at an institutional level, when we try to engage in a risk analysis of how much can we rely on fair dealing, it's very clear that prior to 2002, prior to 2004, a much more cautious, risk-averse position was warranted. But the same position that seemed reasonable in 2003, 2004, was not reasonable in 2007. And it most certainly is not reasonable in 2010. Um, the other thing that the CCH court did was, and I, I'm not going to go through the entire CCH decision, I think it's something that you should all become familiar with and you should all um, look at, especially people who are doing uh, library information services, because the case arose in the context of a, a library. But the CCH court adopted fair dealing criteria. And, and, and basically, so long as you can come within one of those, one of those original criteria, research, private study, perhaps now education, if that stays in, broadly construed as directed by the Supreme Court, then you would go through, you would go through these factually dependent criteria to determine whether or not fair dealing is uh, present in a, in, a, in a certain situation. Um, now, I, I want to look at what the, what the access copyright license looked at, because we're in the transition year right now. The access copyright license that was negotiated back in 2004 was a three-year license. Now, keep in mind that in 2004, the question of fair dealing was not as settled as it is today. It was still in a state of flux. Yes, we had the benefit of the 2002 Court of Appeal decision, but we, have not, we did not yet have the Supreme Court decision. So it's, it's quite understandable um, that the, uh, the, the current access copyright license that went from 2004 to 2007 uh, continued, continued, this, continued this policy of not really paying a lot of attention to fair dealing. Um, you, can look at the, you can look at the agreement, it's online, the library has posted it, the library has posted it online, there's, there's the URL in the top line, and in 2007, it was carried forward for an additional three year extension period, and it expired in August of, of it, it, it expired in August of this year. And, um, what happened was Access Copyright went to the Copyright Board early this year, and they filed a substantially different proposed tariff. So if one of the things we need to do is we need to carefully compare the terms of the current Access Copyright license, which was negotiated by AUCC on behalf of all the Canadian universities. Um, Western signed the license. Western is a direct party with access copyright for this license. It was negotiated centrally by AUCC, but individual institutions needed to sign it. And until August, 30, until August 31st, that's the license that was in effect. And I understand that Western signed an extension um, holding that license, uh, carrying it forward to the end of uh, this, this year, until December, December 31st. Now, some of the things that are in the current license that are, that are important to um, to understand because they're so different from the proposed tariff is, first of all, <coughs> payment was made in two ways. Um, first of all, there was uh, the, the non-identifiable copying that goes on at all the photocopy machines on campus. And the payment for that made on the basis of the full-time equivalent student, student body. And the rate was $3.38 per FTE. One could argue that after CCH, that rate was too high, and it needed to and it needed to come down. Um, although it was it was 338, that was the 2007 rate, and that was extended through uh, through 2010. In addition to the 338 per FTE, there was there was then the course pack portion, where if, if there was an identifiable work that was put into a course pack, then there would be a 10 cent a page uh, fee that would be paid at the cash register at the time the student purchases the course pack. Of course, uh, as I indicated before, course packs, course, packs have, um, course packs have dwindled in their importance, largely, I think, due to the efforts of the library to make sure that a, a, good, a good run of the journals that we need for our teaching are available through broad site licenses. But I think there are other reasons why course packs have, uh, have, have gone into disfavor. Um, they're expensive. 
Lots of times they include materials that are not compensable, because unless you go to the bookstore and say, here's a form I'm going to fill out that explains why this is not a compensable copy, uh, you, the, the, the students will often be charged 10 cents a page for, 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 for including things that are not compensable copies. Um, course packs are not really particularly user friendly. There's all this language on it that says, um, do not give to anybody else. Um, I don't believe the Western Library actually purchases and collects um, course packs, putting them on reserve, because I think Access Copyright would be very upset about that. Um, so it, it, it's largely, there are the, the reasons why people don't like, don't like course packs. Um, from the point of view of a professor, to get a course pack order in um, by, the, by the deadline is difficult. If you're teaching, if you're not teaching the exact same course term after term after term, you're teaching in an area that is constantly changing, it's, um, you, you really don't know sometimes until, you know, the day before class what you're going to talk about because when you've got current events overtaking situations, you can't, you, you have to rely on some amount of flexibility to bring current events into the class and that's, um, I think that's evident quite a bit. The other thing is the, the access copyright license in effect um, reserved the question of fair dealing. It reserved the question of fair dealing. It says, look, we can't agree on what fair dealing is, so we're just going to agree to disagree about what fair dealing is. And if something, if something constitutes fair dealing, it's excluded. And I, I think the problem is a lot of people think that the access copyright license superseded fair dealing. Whereas in fact it was not it was not substitutive, it was additive. If something constitutes fair dealing, it's excluded from the access copyright license. And the, the, the problem after 2004 is educational institutions never really took account of what, what the CCH case meant in terms of the expansion of, uh, of fair dealing. So, so the Western, the Western, the Western agreement, which is going to be um, in effect until until the end of the year, does have an exclusion for fair dealing. But when you look at um, when you look at how it's been implemented, that's not really that's not really the case. Now, turning to the proposed tariff, it was filed in March. There was a there was a comment. There was an objections period, which ended in August, and there were over a hundred objections that were filed. Um, Traditionally, it's been felt that the lead objector, the, the, the group that owns the objection, was AUCC on behalf of the universities. And indeed, AUCC did file um, a very short summary, um, cursory um, objection. It was filed by uh, the law firm of Oslers. And the lawyer who filed the objection on behalf of Access, the lawyer who filed the objection on behalf of AUCC, turns out he's the same lawyer that represents the legal publishers in the CCH case going up to, um, going up to the Supreme Court. Um, it, was a, it was a confident three-page letter, but it didn't, have any, it didn't have any passion to it. It didn't have any, it didn't have any public policy, um, it didn't have any public policy feel to it. In contrast, this time, uh, there, there, were, there were quite a few objections that were, fi that were filed. The Canadian Library Association filed a very strong objection. The Canadian Association of University Teachers Canadian Federation of Students filed uh, a, a very detailed exception that, that went to, that, that actually went through some of the points that I talked about in July that I'm talking about today. The Canadian Alliance of uh, Student Associations um, and, and other, other, other groups filed, filed objections. So right now what you've got at the Copyright Board is a very, very interesting situation where you've got this exceptionally controversial tariff. And keep in mind, this is, this is access copyrights inaugural tariff. This is, their, this is their first tariff that's going to the Copyright Board. Because recall, previous iterations of this did not go to the Copyright Board. They were negotiated between AUCC and Access Copyright. So this is actually the first time that Access Copyright is going to the, um, is going to the Copyright Board. So to, su to, summarize the, um, to summarize the objections, and I, I think if you, if you uh, look at the CFS, CAUT, objection and the CLA objection, you'll get a, you'll get a much more detailed, detailed sense of this. To look, at the, um, to look at these objections, we see that they're general, they're general problems with the proposed tariff. Um, the easiest one to talk about, really, is the, ex the, the just excessive amount of money 
that they're, that they're asking for. They're asking for $45 for an FTE, 35, 35 if you're in a community college, and they're not asking for the 10 cents a page for the course pack. So rather than have a somewhat reasonable low FTE plus the 10 cents a page for the course pack, they've decided to not abandon the course pack, because as we'll see, we still have the burden of reporting what goes into the course collection. But they're not collecting the 10 cents a page. So the, 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 um, the analogy that I made in the, um, in the comments to the press that got picked up in the Western News was, this is like going to an all-you-can-eat buffet. It's $45 a head. Uh, We're not going to be charging you 10 cents a page for additional copies you make, but each student is going to be assessed um, $45. We have no idea where they got the $45 from. And on its face, it's excessive. If you look at the statistics of FTE students in Canada and, and put this matter in some perspective, it's, it's exceptionally, it's unbelievable, it's extraordinary that they have set this so high. Because if you multiply the FTE for community colleges times $35 and the FTE for colleges and universities at $45 and take out Quebec, you're looking at about $40 million a year, which is, which is, which is extraordinary given access copyrights current revenues from everyone, which includes K through 12, it includes businesses, it includes governments, is less than $35 million a year. So this is, this, I think it's fair to say that this is a cash grab. And it's understood that the way the copyright board often works, at least in the end, the way it turns out, is one side says two, another side says 10, and you end up with six. So prob probably as smart negotiators, they started a little hot. But there's no, there's no reasonable basis, there's no reasonable basis for, um, for, why it's, for why it's that high. This is a problem. It's gonna create a problem for students. And for the most part, I think universities have been uh, responsible in not passing this increase on to students right away. There is, there is one notable exception, uh, however, I'm very, very sorry to say, and that's um, the University of Western Ontario which in, which in June, the Board of Governors uh, passed, uh, passed a fee increase on to the students to cover the anticipated possible um, fee increase. Um, basically, they're saying that it's not really gonna be $45, more likely that it will be 25 or $30. In the agenda item before the Board of Governors, in the agenda item before the Board of Governors, they said, it's, it's expected that it will be $25 to $30. In the minutes, now it's, it is hoped it will be $25 to $30. So I, I don't know where the Board of Governors is getting its information from, but this was an exceptionally bad move on their part, and it, it essentially is like waving the white flag before we, before we even started. And the idea that we can just pass this on to the students and not grapple with the broader policy question of, hey, wait a minute, Number one, why is this so high? Number two, what about all these other problems which they didn't even consider? And number three, if we don't like this license, if we don't like this tariff at the end of the at the end of the um, at the end of the procedure, we don't have to take it. We can implement some other policy. And rather than do that, the Western way is to just don't ask any questions, pass the fee increase on to the students. Unfortunately, unfortunately, um, this is this is going to spread. And I understand that Wilfrid Laurier now is going to be looking at the same proposal in November. I, I hope that there will be more questions raised by the students at Wilfrid Laurier. Um, I think one, one notable thing here is not only did the student representative on the Board of Governors support this, he seconded it. Um, uh, so I, I hope that there will be um, some, 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 some more careful thought given to the students at uh, Laurier than, than was done here at Western. So in addition to the fact that there's a um, excessive and unjustified increase, there are a lot of other problems with, uh, with the tariff, some of which go way beyond copyright concerns. They go to concerns of academic freedom, they go to concerns of privacy, and they go to concerns of what the fundamental nature of the ability of uh, members of a university community to communicate with each other using things like email can be without, without, it, being, without it being picked up by an agency like Access Copyright. Uh, before I was before I was making the uh, before I was making the argument that university libraries uh, university administrations do not always 
do a good job understanding the dual nature of the access copyright fair dealing relationship. And this is just some language from uh, the Waterloo, the Waterloo page, which is uh, as as university web pages go in terms of copyright materials, Waterloo's is actually one of the um, is actually one of the better ones. Certainly much better than York's, which says if you want to make copies of materials not covered by the license and the materials not in the public domain, then permission must be obtained from, from the owner. And this is, this is just absolutely dreadful. And until a couple of months ago, this is what was up at Western and Mercy Community. They have, they have changed it to say or constitutes a fair dealing. So Western's a bit ahead of, uh, of the game in that, in that, in that, in that respect. But uh, I go into much more detail in the article in the Geist Reader about the failure of the university establishments to properly uh, implement this fair dealing. But getting back to the problems with the proposed tariff, um, so I, I, I've already talked about the excessive assessment. The, the overbroad definition of copy takes us back, takes us back to what's in the um, to what's in the Copyright Act, and. I don't mean for you to have to digest all of this now. It's, it's, it's on the web, and this is, this is the actual text from the license. But notice that it includes posting a link or a hyperlink to a digital copy. Now, under, under even the broadest possible reading of Section 3, the owner's reproduction right does not, under any circumstances, it include posting a link or a hyperlink to a digital copy. Um, we have something called hypertext. We have something called the World Wide Web. We have the internet exactly because posting to other people's work is not a compensable copy. So for access copyright to even include this in their definition of copy, and we'll see, we'll see in a moment that if something is, is included within the definition of copy, that's going to trigger other things that are going to have to happen. This is a huge problem. Uh, as is projecting an image or displaying a digital copy, this is, there's, <coughs> there are provisions in the Copyright Act that make it clear. That, that you can do that without without infringement. So in, to, to include uh, to include some of these things, transmitting a digital copy from a secure network that's stored on a local storage device, projecting the image, displaying a digital copy, and, 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 and exceptionally posting a link or a hyperlink to a digital copy, um, these just are not compensable. Um, these just are not com compensable um, events under under Section Three. The Copyright Board does not have the authority in a copyright board proceeding to expand the definition of section three. That would be something that um, if Parliament wanted to say um, that there's going to be a posting right, a hyperlinking right in section three, well, I don't think Parliament would do that, but it would be Parliament that would have to, um, it would be Parliament that would have to do that. Now, currently we have, we have what's known as course packs. But we're not going to have a 10 cent a page uh, collection for course packs. We're going to have um, what's now called course collections. One of the other differences between the current access copyright license and where this is going is that the current access copyright license is for mechanical reprography, photocopy, and the course packs, and other, and other mechanical reproductions. This is, this is everything digital. You can see that this is essentially digital. So, I want to look very carefully at this definition of course collection because this is where we have the problem. Course collection means assembled paper copies of published works. Fine, that's what we have now. Digital copies of published works that are emailed, linked, or hyperlinked to, or posted, uploaded to, or stored on a secure network. That is, when you unpack that phrase, when you unpack this, um, this, 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 v, this V phrase here, there's a lot going on there. And if I read that correctly, I see the word email. And I don't know how Access Copyright expects to be able to have access to the contents of emails that go back and forth between uh, the people who are involved. Or presumably here we're talking about professors to students, or maybe even to other students. But I, I, think, it's, I think it's really a problem that this, is, that this is so broad. The reason why... Um, the, re the, the reason why it's so problematic is when we get to the reporting requirements, even though we're not paying 10 cents a page, because we're paying per head, the, the reporting requirements include monthly reports, preparing monthly re reports for access copyright that include any additions to the course collection in the last month, 
which under this language would include, I think, stuff that professors email to, to students, which means Access Copyright is going to have an expectation of having access to all of our secure servers, including our, uh, including our, uh, including our emails. Um, yeah, so this is, this is, a, this is a very significant um, uh, inclusion. <coughs> so we've got, we've got, we've got the, uh, we've got the overbroad definitions, we've got the overbroad amount of, of money. Recall that in the current access copyright license, there was an exclusion for fair dealing. If something is fair dealing, it's not included. There is no similar exclusion in the proposed tariff. So some of the some of the actual more reasonable provisions of the current tariff are not of the current license that's been in effect since 2004 are not being carried over into the new uh, into the new tariff. Putting all these problems aside, assuming that there were we, we didn't have an excessive price, uh, unreasonable reporting requirements, and overbroad definitions, we also we then have to look at well, okay, what are we getting? Because if we're getting something really good, if we're getting something that is clearly fair dealing plus, then, it, then, then, it would, then it's worth something. But section three of the tariff tells us what we get. And when you look at this carefully, what they're doing is they're selling back our fair dealing rights to us, which we no longer have under the tariff. Um, it's not like you can go beyond this. So all of the rights that you would have under the tariff, such as they are, are limited to 10% of a work, maybe 20% of a work, um, an article, things that, things that under a reasonable interpretation of fair dealing might be included within fair dealing. We, if we had more time, we could go through each one of these points and play through the six fair dealing factors and sort of and do scenarios in terms of uh, how close is this to fair dealing. But I think the fact that Access Copyright has drafted their tariff saying, we're gonna let you engage in what's broadly considered to be fair dealing. And we're gonna charge you $45 a head and make you report everything. It, 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 that's, that's, the gist, that's the gist of the problem here. And I wish the Western Board of Governors had given more thought to this before they just said, oh, well, we hope it's gonna be $25. Because you're not getting $25, you're not getting $5 worth of, uh, worth of value. Um, there's a limitation for technological protection measures. Um, this tariff does not authorize you to, uh, to, to circumvent uh, a digital lock, which is not that relevant under current law, but it most certainly would be relevant under Bill C-32. I will leave that to the next speaker to, 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 to discuss in more detail how that's going to be um, implemented. So I'm going, I'm going to move off that now. Um, here's your definition of uh, technological protection measures in Bill C-32. Um, but the reporting requirements. Not only do you have to do the normal bibliographic information, but you have to um, you have to give them information about what you have to give them information about licenses that you that you have with publishers. Notice under M it says direct license from publisher aggregator if applicable. Now, if you've directed if you if you've contracted directly with a publisher aggregator, you've purchased their consent. That is of no concern whatsoever to access copyright. Because assuming the access copyright license is worth something, it certainly doesn't mean anything if you've already purchased the consent of, of the direct owner. Because all the access copyright license is doing is acting as a substitute for that, for that, for that consent. So this, this, is, this, is, this is troublesome. With respect to emails, the educational institution shall only be required to compile the above records of digital copies emailed by or on behalf of a staff member. Now, while this is written in the form of an exclusion that might give some comfort to students who are not staff members, for those of us who are staff members, which would include a very, very broad definition, it's not just, it's not just professors, it's all academic staff, it's all graduate assistants, that includes your email. It says it right there. And within 30 days at the end of each month, the institution shall forward the record in section 61 to access copyright. They're going to set up an information system that is able to capture all the emails I sent to my students every month and everything that I put on whatever the new OWL configuration is, post web CT, whatever that's going to be, the secure server <coughs> information. Every month, um, this, is, this is an exceptionally invasive um, reporting requirement. In addition, 
addition to the reporting requirement, there are survey requirements. The institution will participate in the survey and will, will, will ensure that all authorized persons cooperate fully with the requirements of access to copyright. And if an educational institution unreasonably refuses to participate in the survey, the licenses will cease to be in effect. Whereupon you must sort of uh, erase all digital copies that you have um, under the license. So believe me, once an institution goes this far, they're going to want to, they're going to want to cooperate with this, which also means how is the university going to ensure that all authorized persons fully cooperate? Am I going to Am I going to be directed by the administration that I might turn my email account over to the access to copyright um, auditors? Because I don't think I'm going to do that. And, I, and I, don't, I don't think a lot of faculty members are going to want to do that. The problem being that the university already has access to all of my um, emails. So even if I don't want to do it, uh, they may just say, well, we're under a contractual obligation to do it. Now, we're going to have, we're going to have a long, long discussion at some point with the privacy commissioner about this. And I think that Access Copyright knows or should know that this is triggering a, this will trigger uh, a, privacy, a privacy complaint. But it would be, it would be nice if, if they tried to reconcile Canadian privacy law, which does have some requirements, into, into what they're reasonably requesting universities um, to do. Uh, records must be retained for six years. And um, these are just some of the, um, these are just some of the, um, these are just some of the provisions. I don't really think I um, have, have time to get into a um, full discussion, a full discussion of Bill C-32. So I'm going to go through this really quickly. How much time do I have? Where, where are you going? Okay, and I want to leave time for your questions and comments. So I'm just going to make this exceptionally um, brief. There are some, unlike Bill 61, pardon? 145. Okay. I still want to leave time for um, questions and comments from you. Unlike Bill C61, which um, didn't have much going for it at all, there are some reasonably good provisions in Bill C32. I've already spoken about the educational um, provisions. Fundamental flaw, of course, is the digital block provisions. We've got, uh, we've got the expansion of fair dealing. Not quite the such as language that we were hoping for, but putting education in um, certainly is a, 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 big, a, big, a, a big improvement for educators. Then you've got some of these new sections, 2921 through 2924, which all do nice things. These, these are all steps in the positive directions, but why not subsume all these individual situations within a broader fair dealing? The problem with these other new provisions is they contain their own limitations and counter exceptions, particularly with respect to your obligation not to circumvent technological protections. Um, so while these are nice, they don't really go far enough and it would make more sense to just sort of incorporate them into fair dealing. For instance, the user generated content, which is huge. That should just be seen as, a, as, as something that comes within fair dealing and to the extent that it's transformative, that would be a factor that would, that would help the person quite a bit in terms of uh, of fair dealing. Um, there's, there's special exceptions for educational institutions, which I think warrant a little bit of discussion, because I think these are all very bad. I think all four of these are very bad, and the educational community should be um, opposing, opposing these, especially 30.02 and 30.03. Um, 30.01 um, 30 has this ex exceptionally difficult and complex definition of a lesson, and it says you can make digital copies for, for use presumably in, uh, in, distant, in distance education. Um, if you do certain things, and if you make sure that there are copy, that there are certain copy and use controls um, in, in, in effect, um, most of these activities would already be permitted under fair dealing if you give fair dealing a reasonable interpretation. There's also the exceptionally controversial section 30.04, special internet exception that's being promoted by some of the groups in the educational community, whereas other groups in the educational community are, are, are opposed to it. Um, I don't really have time to adequately treat this question today. I do deal with it in some great detail in the uh, new article in, in, the, Geist, in the Geist Reader. Um, and this is an example of slides that could have been, uh, slides that could have been uh, removed. 
I wanted to talk about Section 30.02. Section 30.02 is a very, very strange and little understood and technical uh, provision, highly unreadable, highly, um, highly difficult to, to understand. It purports to allow digital reproduction and communication of something that started in paper and now you're allowed to digitally re re reproduce it. But it only applies, and here's the rub, it only applies to educational institutions that have a reprographic license with access copyright. The problem with that is it expired on August 31st. And of course you can get an extension through um, December 31st. And access copyright is also asked universities across Canada to, to, to execute a further extension post January 1st 2011. Um, what what 30.02 does in essence is it, it locks in, it gives universities sort of a, an incentive to be locked in to access copyright agreements in, in, a, in an environment where they probably have options to walk away from access copyright entirely. Section 30.02 three says that if you're paying a certain amount and then later on if you're paying a certain amount under section 30.02 and then there's a there's a license or a tariff that, that that creates a higher amount you have to pay the difference retroactively and in fairness if it's a lower amount you get refunded the difference retro retroactively the problem with this is and it doesn't say record is section 30.03 must, <coughs> must imply that if you're under an obligation to make up the difference, you're going to have to keep records of everything you do. Now, the reason why I think there's this tie-in, which I claimed at the beginning of the discussion between Bill C-32 and the Access Copyright Proposed Tariff is exactly this. It's the <coughs> burdensome record-keeping requirement, which universities should be exceptionally concerned about. Universities, they, they can make the money go away by just passing it on to the students. But I don't see how the university is going to deal with the exceptionally complex record keeping requirement, which is also built right into Bill C-32. So if this provision passes, it's going to create some form of lock-in into these types of provisions. And it's going to actually bring into the statute, and this is, this is incredible, it's actually going to incorporate into the copyright law because one, one of the requirements of section 30.02 is that you stay in compliance with all the terms of the, um, of the license or tariff. It's going to incorporate into the copyright law the private contracts that are entered into between the university and access copyright, or a, or a tariff that's approved by the copyright board, thereby giving the copyright board or private contracts the ability to essentially amend the rights and obligations that people have under the copyright, the copyright act. Um, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very serious, uh, it's a very serious issue. So when you look at the relationship between the propo proposed tariff and Bill C-32, they're being carefully orchestrated. They're being carefully orchestrated, which is why I still call it double trouble for higher education. Thank you, thank you very much. And um, I would like to take questions uh, or comments. Yeah. What does access copyright do with all the money? Well, there they first of all, about twenty percent of it goes into administrative overhead and the rest is distributed to rights holders. So that much does go Yes. Um, the question of the allocation of access copyright revenues between publishers and creators has been exceptionally controversial with the access copyright. Several years ago, access copyright under pressure, not from the copyright critics, not from the people who are writing in Michael Geist's reader, not by, not by the library community, not by Cal, not by, not by these law professors like Michael and, and myself, but by the actual writers groups who are in access copyright. They were, they were, <coughs> they were pressured to uh, have an outside uh, investigator come in and do a, do a thorough study of um, access copyright to distribution uh, practices. And Professor Friedland, for, formerly the dean at the University of uh, Toronto, a very, very well-respected uh, legal, legal educator, wrote, wrote a report that was exceptionally critical of access copyright and that it called for a variety of different changes. And to access copyright's credit, they did eventually 
I'll post the full text of that report, which you can get to if you, if you go to the Access Copyright site. But there still is a lot of um, dissatisfaction among the actual creators as to how the distributions are made. And I would take the position that it favors uh, large publishers more so than the small, the, the small authors who they stand behind in lobbying times. And it's, it's still very controversial. What do you think uh, that we can do at this point to uh, make any sort of difference? Well, I, I think there are, um, f first of all, Bill C-32 is still very much alive and on the table. And I think to the extent that there's going to be any uh, lobbying with your, with, your member of, with your member of parliament, if you're inclined to write letters to MPs, I think the two main messages are, first and foremost, leave education in, in, in uh, fair dealing. It's, it's essential that education be retained, that the word education be retained in fair dealing. The, the, uh, the, uh, the, other, the other educational provisions, I think, are secondary to that, but that is where access copyright in the publishing industry is putting all of their lobbying attention into getting the word education taken, taken out. They're not that disturbed about the parody or satire. That's probably going to happen. But it's the word education they want to take out. That's point number one. And point two is the digital locks provisions need to be substantially amended so they, they only apply to acts which constitute infringement. Because as they're drafted, they're like the digital locks provisions in the, um, in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And it's not limited. The prohibition on circumvention is not limited to acts that otherwise uh, constitute infringement. And I, I, I imagine that you will go into this in some greater detail when you talk about technological um, protections next, next week. So I, I, didn't, I didn't dwell on that. But um, you, could be, you could be guilty of circumventing the technological protection measures even if your reason for going inside the information store is to pull out public domain materials, to pull out things that would constitute fair dealing under the circumstances. So the message to, uh, to legislatures has to be limit the digital locks provisions to situations where there's infringement. In 2005, the uh, Bill C-60 that was put forward had a digital locks provision, and that was reasonably balanced. That was limited to acts of uh, infringement. Whereas Bill C-61 and Bill C-32 go way beyond that, and it's like the U.S. Digital Millennium Copyright Act, which is why I think we're quite justified in referring to it as the Canadian uh, DMCA. So there's that lobby. Um, the, the number two, beyond that, I think um, you know, the access copyright tariff at the board has to be opposed. That's being done very aggressively by CAUT, CFS, um, other groups. It's being done. It's being done by AUCC. Um, personally, I'm I'm worried. Personally, I would like to see AUCC be a bit more aggressive and have a bit more gusto in their in their opposition to um, to to the tariff. And I'm also very concerned that they're not operating in a transparent way. AUCC did not post their objections to the to the internet. I mean, they're floating around. Uh, they're, they're accessible, but AUCC never posted them. They're not really being that forthcoming in talking to people about it. And furthermore, Access Copyright has filed a motion with the board to get rid of all the other objectors other than uh, AUCC and their, their, their community college um, counterpart. So I think the, uh, locally the message needs to be sent to university administrators that <coughs> we, we want you to be very aggressive in terms of opposing this. And it's not just a question, this is not just a question of whether it's $45 or $20 or $25. Because even if it was $10, even if it was $5, even if it was $2, it doesn't matter because there's enough in that tariff that is very, very dangerous, separate and apart from how much money is changing hands. So I think the university establishment needs to get a very, very clear um, uh, the message from the bottom up that this is totally unacceptable and that we expect that they will do everything in their power to resist it. They're getting it from the top down. I mean, they're getting it from the national associations, CLA, uh, Cal, CFS, CASA, um, are, have all been very clear. But they need to hear it, they need to hear it on their own campuses. Um, Western is, um, Western's uh, a particular situation because they've taken the additional step of uh, essentially Passing the passing 
some portion of it on to students ahead of time. And I think the Western administration needs to have a very strong message from, from students that this is just not acceptable. Well, it needs to come from everybody. Um, the problem is there has been zero student opposition here. There has been no indication whatsoever that this is a problem from the students. Uh, for, for whatever reason this year, the leaders of the student associations just do not seem to be taking it up. Some of the student government politicians are actually you know, publicly supporting this, and it's, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult situation. So to the extent you have any involvement in, 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 in USC or, 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 or SOGS, I think this issue has to be great. So it might be that the, the most important thing that you can do is, is something here locally Rest assured that Western has gotten on the map of people around the country on this question, and people are watching developments that um, Western and now up upcoming at Laurier um, very, very closely. So in terms of what you can do that would have some effect, I, I think there's the, there's the national lobbying, of course, but there's also the local, the local practice, which is particularly important here at Western. Yes? Is there any possibility of a third party emerging to break the monopoly that this copyright has on this? And sort of this, is, this is an exceptionally interesting question that you're raising. And um, a legal scholar and practitioner by the name of Howard Knopf, K-N-O-P-F, wrote, um, wrote a very prescient piece a number of years ago pointing out that there's nothing in the Copyright Act that gives access to copyright and monopoly. Anybody could set up a collective. Uh, and he's looking, he was looking at the higher educational establishment to do that in a, in, a, in a much better way than access copyright. I think his summary was CAUT may have the will but not the way, and ABCC probably has the way but not the will. And the problem would be getting those groups together. There's nothing in the Copyright Act that, that precludes another group from setting up an alternative collective. It goes back to what some of the basic values of the right. But I think even beyond that, the era that we're in right now um, is very different from the 1988 era when the uh, collectives were actually written in to the copyright attack. Basically, the 1988 legislation allowed access to copyright, access to copyright to, um, to exist. Prior to that, it was just, it was just the public performance right in music that had, that had collectives. And the, the, the legislative trade-off was, we are going to give you, uh, we're going to give you a pass on copyright. In other words, we're going to exempt you from, from, a, from a competition but liability. And I think that that has to be re-examined. But the other thing that's changed since 1988 is, number one, you have much more in the way of site licenses and from aggregators. Number two, people are creating their own works. Number three, you've got all the digital content out there, much of which is in a, a Creative Commons type of license. Uh, number, number four, fair dealing is huge. You have post 2004, where it was not in 2004. So all the reasons why we need access to copyright in the first place need to be reevaluated. And while I think the question of having an alternative to access to copyright is something that needs to be explored, perhaps the better question is, do we need a collective at all? If we have, if we have a reasonable fear of dealing and if we're purchasing a lot of what we need. I mean, what do the law students here? Especially with the, with the work that the law library does in, in getting access to Lexis and E. Carswell, what do the law students need the access copyright tariff for? When you consider that most of what they're studying are, are, are government works that are under a reproduction uh, license anyway, and what's not, the, the, most of the literature comes through Lexis or Heinle and Line or something else we've, we've, we've licensed. So why do we even need it? There's still people that want to do that. Do they have to justify their 